Hi, I'm Bill Wiley. I'm Stephen Dell. And I'm Rob Weinstock. And, and we're, we're the, the co-chief medical, medical editors, editors of Cataract and Refractive Surgery today. today. Welcome to another episode of CRST, the podcast. Well, I shouldn't say another episode because this is kind of a big one. September 2021 is special because it marks CRST's 20th year in print. And 20 years of cutting edge content is something to celebrate, right? We think so. Today, we'll come full circle back to the debut issue of CRST by revisiting one of the topics featured in that very first issue, phaco emulsification. In 2001, Howard Fine wrote an article that looked at emerging technologies in the field of cataract surgery. A lot has changed since then, and this month CRST asked surgeons to share with us how they have improved the efficiency of their surgical technique with advances in modern phaco technology. Today, several of them share their thoughts on our podcast. I'm Laura Straub, Editor-in-Chief of CRST. First, James Davison from Wolf Eye Clinic in Iowa shares his experience with various evolutions over the course of his career. FACO emulsification has changed a lot since 2001 when CRST debuted, and I was halfway through my career. 21 years before then, I learned to perform FACO emulsification from my partners John Grather and Russ Watt, who themselves had learned to perform the procedure at a course directed by Charles Kilman in 1972. Kilman published his pioneering work in 1967 when I was a junior in high school. I learned more about fake emulsification from Bob Sinsky, Dick Kratz, Tom Mazzocco, and Mike Colvard, a friend of mine from my residency at Mayo Clinic. When I joined the Wolf Eye Clinic, the surgeons there had transitioned from using the original Cavitron Kelman Faco emulsifier, which they lovingly called Big Bertha, to using the Coopervision 8000 Faco system, which was introduced in 1978. That unit had a foot pedal that, when pressed, activated ultrasonic energy. We had to assemble the large handpiece, which featured vibrating metal plates and separate hoses from a fluid bath to cool those metal plates. The circulating nurse turned a knob when we asked for more or less energy. Vacuum was fixed at 47 millimeters of mercury, the same level available with the succeeding 1985 model, the Coopervision 9001. This model featured a piezoelectric handpiece and linear FACO power activated with a surgeon-controlled foot switch. It also had a high and low vacuum settings for cortex removal. With those early machines, we simply debulked the central nucleus by shaving it away and emulsified the peripheral nucleus from the outside in. Imagine eating a hamburger that way. While repeatedly prolapsing a new superior edge so that the phaco tip could aspirate new lens dust. With repeated rotations of the nucleus until the entire peripheral edge was eventually shaved away, only the central posterior plate was left to be emulsified and aspirated. With all the revolutionary advances since the birth of phaco emulsification in 1967, who would have thought that we'd be using the same core technology today? Several landmark advances of surgical techniques were made in the 1980s and 1990s. These included the development of capsulorexis, divide and conquer, cortical cleaving hydrodissection, phaco chop, stop and chop, and phaco pre-chop. Phaco chop techniques could be executed safely thanks to the development of viscoat, which protected the cornea, and improvements in technology that allowed surgeons to simultaneously control vacuum level, flow rate, and tip movement. With Elcon's introduction of the Legacy 20,000 in 1993, surgeons could control vacuum up to a whopping 101 millimeters of mercury and use 0.9 millimeter diameter aspiration bypass system tips. Ten years later, the introduction of the Infinity Vision system allowed surgeons to control vacuum up to 500 millimeters of mercury. The Infinity also integrated pulse and burst programming, and an upgrade two years later permitted torsional tip movement for increased nuclear followability. This helped to reduce phaco time and balance salt solution volume. With torsional ultrasound, larger chunks of the nucleus could be separated and aspirated more efficiently. This system still required small situational adjustments, 
because relatively abrupt changes in dynamics could make the posterior capsule more vulnerable or cause the iris to shudder, decreasing pupil size. The Centurion Vision System replaced the Infinity in 2013. Its 0.9 millimeter Intrepid Aspiration Bypass System balance tip increased emulsification efficiency while minimizing tip movement of the FACO tip shaft at the incision. Refined computerized blending of torsional and longitudinal tip motions improved the control with which quadrants of all grades could be aspirated. The integrated dual pump technology of the Intrepid and its programmable IOP and vacuum flow ramps greatly refine fluidic controls and intraoperative behavior. My technique has evolved over time, but my goal remains the same, to maximize capsule zonular integrity and minimize corneal endothelial cell loss. I've always believed that the machine-calculated total dissipated energy of the FACO tip affects corneal endothelial cell density less than the proximity of the tip and the pieces of the nucleus that grind against the cornea. The further away from the cornea, the better. I still create four separate quadrants and hollow out the nucleus as much as possible while it is in situ in the capsular bag. The bulk of each quadrant can be reduced by aspirating as much deep nuclear dust as possible while creating an intracapsular space in which to emulsify the remaining relatively two-dimensional plates of the nucleus. This helps to protect the cornea when larger pieces of the nucleus are drawn into the anterior chamber for emulsification. The average rate of endothelial cell loss for hard cataracts with this technique is 5%. The capsule is protected by the physical insulation offered by the nuclear plates underneath the quadrant that is being emulsified. Until five or six years ago, I used a customized, modified cyclodialysis spatula by Stortz SP7-71996. This reduced the diameter from 0.5 millimeters to 0.33 millimeters. I also used the Connor wand to tear the posterior nuclear plate after sculpting deep grooves. This maneuver was hard to execute if the nucleus very soft or very hard. Art Weinstein reintroduced me to the Akahoshi Prechopper, which I now use in about 80% of cases. I find this instrument to be extremely helpful for, se for separating soft quadrants. For quadrants with greater nuclear color or nuclear opalescence, that is harder quadrants, I use the cyclodialysis spatula or the Connor wand. For very hard or mature cataracts, I even use the Akahoshi Prechopper under an OVD after grooving. The instrument is placed curbside down to crack the posterior nuclear plate completely with almost no nucleus displacement. I switched to the epinucleus setting to aspirate enough OVD before I reestablish fake emulsification tip energy, thereby trying to prevent thermal damage to the corneal incision. Optimizing my personal settings on the Centurion provides me with a level of control that gives me confidence in any challenging situation. I'm not aggressive in my settings so that I can be proactive rather than reactive. For soft nuclei that resist cracking, the sculpt setting is used to debulk the nucleus, and the epinucleus setting is used to aspirate successive clock hours of peripheral nucleus as it is rotated towards the tip. This rotation often results simply from the aspiration of successive new material at the tip. For firm nuclei, the sculpt setting is used to create grooves. After cracking, the deeper firm corners are shaved away from each quadrant. Drawing in the first quadrant of soft nuclei can be challenging. In my experience, the epinucleus setting provides foot pedal controlled vacuum adjustments with preset vacuum trigger tip movement so that I can gradually draw the first quadrant away from the peripheral capsule. I then can switch to the pre-programmed vacuum rise time of the quadrant removal setting and control amplitude of the FACO tip motion with the foot pedal. To improve fine control, the last quadrant or two can be carefully acquired in position using the epinucleus setting at any time during quadrant removal. If the nucleus is hard, I will re-inject a dispersive OVD, especially before aspirating the last quadrant. I wish I could trade in my first 10 years of practice for another 10 now, but I know that that's not going to happen. I've been lucky to enjoy so many advances in phaco emulsification. I don't know how it can get much better, but I know it will. Congratulations, CRST. You have delivered timely and accurate information and insight 
that have allowed ophthalmologists such as myself to improve our surgical techniques, practices, and patient outcomes and experiences. I look forward to another successful and meaningful 20 years of this publication. Now, Hamani Goyal from NYU Langone Eye Center in New York discusses how there is always room for improvement in FACO technique. Here are some of the cataract surgery efficiency milestones of my career. 2007, learning the basics during residency and building confidence as a surgeon. 2008, completing the last three months of residency with Dr. Michael Najat. 2015, learning to go faster with confidence in part due to improved chamber stability with the Centurion Vision System from Alcon. 2017, learning to obliterate dense cataracts with the MyLoop from Carl Zeiss Meditech my last scleral tunnel, 2018, learning MIGS and subsequently combining MIGS with ISEN Inject and Cahook Dual Blade Goniotomy, 2021, working towards reducing transition times from one step to the next and learning from friends, including Dr. Lorenzo Cervantes. Even after 12 years in practice, I know there is room for greater efficiency in my cataract surgery technique. In my mind, a deliberate flow must be present for surgeons to generate efficiency. Number one, practice. Number two, watch and learn from your peers how to perform new techniques and use new tools. And number three, review your own videos and note areas for improvement. This process must be repeated continually to ensure that your efficiency does not become stagnant. If you think about it, this process is how all surgeons get started. Residents practice what they learn from watching their attendings. As residents become more proficient, they are encouraged to try new techniques and use new tools, and they are critiqued on every step. They go through the deliberate and constant flow of practicing, watching, and reviewing until they become nearly perfect. We are all works in progress, concentrating on ways of making cataract surgery more efficient. The key is to share our ideas and learn from each other. New tools and techniques are introduced so often that keeping an open mind and proactively continuing to learn new things is necessary. So many of my colleagues have helped to inspire me and develop the surgeon in me, and they continue to motivate me to become better every day. I aim to pass this knowledge on to my residents and motivate others to do the same. Moving right along, Bjorn Johansson, from Linköping University in Sweden, talks about increasing efficiency by minimizing risks. Advances in cataract surgery continuously change the procedure for the better. I am astounded by the number and variety of developments I have witnessed since I performed my first complete case in 1990. A successful intracapsular cryo extraction with no evident vitreous loss and a happy aphakic patient as a result. I transitioned from extracapsular cataract extraction through a large incision Two phaco emulsification performed through a 3.5 millimeter scleral tunnel incision and the implantation of a one piece 6 millimeter PMMA intraocular lens. Not long thereafter, I began performing surgery through a 2.75 millimeter clear corneal incision and implanting a foldable intraocular lens. Recently, I incorporated advances such as immediate sequential bilateral cataract surgery, ISBCS, intracameral antibiotics, microincisional cataract surgery through a 1.8 millimeter incision, and preloaded intraocular lenses. To describe how I have increased my surgical efficiency in the past few years, is challenging given the breadth of developments in the field. Most cataract procedures are relatively straightforward. 
Around 10% of patients, however, present with one or more of the following. Limited pupil dilatation, weak zonules, intraoperative floppy iris syndrome, a mature white cataract, a dark brown rock hard cataract, a history of vitrectomy with or without silicone oil, or a shallow or deep anterior chamber. I work in a tertiary university hospital, and I encounter a large number of highly complicated cataract cases. Whether the cataract procedure is routine or complex, efficient surgery demands a stable chamber. This can be achieved most easily with a FACO system that allows the surgeon to adjust the ultrasound power and evacuating force system independently on the fly as necessary. I operate through a 1.8 millimeter tunnel incision and I can adjust the evacuating force and ultrasound power independently with the dual linear foot pedal control of the Stellaris Elite Vision Enhancement System. The active fluidics function of the Stellaris Elite can help to maintain a stable chamber while keeping the intraocular pressure low. This is especially advantageous for eyes with advanced glaucoma. Minimizing the risk of adverse events during cataract surgery is crucial. For patients with complex cataracts or ocular comorbidities, especially greater safety is associated with greater efficiency. For uncomplicated cases, I favor immediate sequential bilateral cataract surgery, ISBCS, to reduce risks and optimize efficiency. I find that compared to routine cataract surgery, ISBCS promotes faster visual rehabilitation with the least effort required from both the surgical team and patient. ISBCS is also easier on caregivers because there is only one surgery date rather than two. Many surgeons have adopted ISBCS during the COVID-19 pandemic. ISBCS has become a more acceptable alternative and more surgeons recognize the benefits it brings to themselves, patients and healthcare systems. The United Kingdom Royal College of Ophthalmologists, among others, has issued advice for the safe implementation of ISBCS. With ISBCS, surgery on each eye is a completely separate procedure. And Jason Jones from Jones Eye Clinic in Iowa zeroes in on the importance of simplicity, sophistication, and a meticulous surgical technique. When I think back over the past 20 years, I see that FACO technologies that seem to have incremental improvements at the time had a cumulative and dramatic impact on the safety and efficiency of cataract surgery and on the visual outcomes that the procedure can deliver. My advice to surgeons who want to take their FACO outcomes to the next level is to rely upon both simplicity and sophistication. By the word simplicity, I mean an old school reliance on accurate biometry, meticulous surgical technique, effective communication, and a careful review of cases. I strongly recommend making a video recording of every case and routinely reviewing the footage. When reviewing my own cases, I look for unnecessary movements, mistakes, and vulnerabilities, and I assess how much energy and fluid was used. I also recommend watching videos shared by master surgeons. Investing time in the refinement of surgical technique and the improvement of surgical skills can improve outcomes and efficiency. Learn to use Venturi fluidics, transition to a more aggressive vacuum settings with a Venturi system, and, if the FACO system permits, 
Learn to switch between the venturi and peristaltic modes to take advantage of the benefits of each during a single procedure. In my experience, industry representatives can be helpful when surgeons want to customize and refresh their FACO settings as they alter their techniques. Invest in new tech FACO technology. It is easy to become comfortable with a workhorse device and put off updates, but a new device can provide significantly better fluidics control, chamber stability, ultrasound energy efficiency, and ergonomic comfort. I recently began using the Veritas Vision System, which I have found to offer several advantages over my previous machine. One of these is advanced infusion, which increases irrigation flow with pressurized air, 22 millimeters of mercury, to provide the equivalent of an extra 30 centimeters of infusion bottle height. As I transition to foot pedal positions two and three, the system automatically increases the irrigation pressure to deepen the anterior chamber and expand working space. The advanced tubing system minimizes the variability of fluid volume in the tubing under maximum vacuum, which can reduce line surge. I have been best able to take advantage of these chamber stability features by using a smaller bore 21 gauge FACO tip rather than a 20 gauge tip. Pay attention to technology that can reduce physical and mental stress on the surgeon, staff, and patients. The Veritas emits lower pitch tones, offers the option of dark background screens, and has a small and light swivel handpiece. The distal end of the handpiece can rotate up to 220 degrees without movement of the surgeon's wrist, which can make the handpiece easier to hold and manipulate. The proximal end remains stationary, so the tubing and power cables drape smoothly away. This separation helps me interact with the cataract incisions more gently. My practice has also purchased automated reclining surgical chairs made by UFSK, OSYS, that can be moved easily between the preoperative holding area and the OR. This can reduce the staff's workload and increase patient safety and comfort. Another surgeon from across the pond, Mitrofanis Pavlidis from Augen Centrum Köln in Germany, speaks about his adoption of combined microincisional cataract and vitrectomy surgeries. For the past five years or more, combined microincisional phacovitrectomy, MICVIT, has been my standard technique for the surgical management of vitro-retinal disorders and glucometer cataract. This technique offers multiple performance and outcome benefits. Technical innovations involving sophisticated irrigation aspiration technologies, software-based simulation and next-generation materials, support rapid development in cataract and vitrectomy surgery over the past decade. Further advantages in instrumentation and vitro-retinal surgery systems have, have inspired surgeons, myself included, to evaluate and standardize newer techniques and vitro-retinal maneuvers for improved surgical performance. These evolutions have directly influenced my surgical practice and the evolution of MICVIT into one of my favorite techniques. MICVIT involves performing cataract surgery through 1.8 mm incision and a 27 gauge vitrectomy. A 27-gauge valve trocar is placed in the inferior temporal quadrant 4 mm from the limbus. A 1.8 mm clear cornea incision is made at the 10 clock position. The same FACO knife is then used to make a 1.2 mm paracentesis incision. The angulation of the tip, approximately 90 degrees, combined with a small incision size, minimizes surgically induced astigmatism. Once the incisions have been created, an OVD is injected in the arterial chamber. Creating only two small corneal incisions helps to prevent the OVD from escaping during top-sequence surgical maneuvers. A capsulorexis is then performed with a microtip capsulorexis forceps, such as the Hattenbach and more, that are suitable for FACO procedures using 1.8 mm incisions. The precise distal end of these forceps allows the surgeon to comfortably perform additional capsular axis maneuvers that may be required, including the redirection of an errant tear or the creation of a posterior capsular axis. I use the bevel 30 degree 1.8 mm coaxial, coaxial FACO tip because I find that it improves my ability to direct ultrasound energy and thus avoiding damaging the endothelium. To improve the efficiency of phago 
the faculty is rotated so that peripheral nuclear fragments can be aspirated. Additionally, I find that the wider faculty design provides improved holdability for high efficiency emulsification even with sub 2 mm FACO surgery. Vacuum formation with the FACO vitrectomy machine is based on the dual mode valve timing intelligence aspiration system of the EFA. This provides a linear maximum vacuum level at 680 mm mercury in 0.3 seconds, a considerably faster vacuum rise time than with traditional Venturi systems. In flow control mode, the, the surgeon can determine a precise aspiration flow rate, eliminating pulsation. Further, the valve timing intelligent pump continuously adjusts vacuum for reliable aspiration, ensuring excellent fluidic and retinal stability throughout the procedure. A pressurized balanced salt solution bottle provides intraocular irrigation control. I prefer a one-piece IOL with a four-point haptic design, which is available across a range of lens models. If propulsion and sawing of the anterior chamber occurs, a 5 to 10 second vitrectomy performed through the trocar can release posterior pressure and deepen the anterior chamber. At the end of FACO emulsification, almost no hydration and incision is performed. The cornea should be clear, allowing a, prefer a peripheral vitrectomy to be performed, and the chamber should be stable with no need for suturing. A 27 gauge High flow infusion line is connected to the preset trocar and two additional trocars are placed 3.5 mm from the limbus at the 4th and 10 o'clock positions for the left eye and the 8 and 2 o'clock positions for the right eye. A smooth flow control 27 gauge vitrectomy is then performed using a double action PVC cutting vitrectomy. In eyes without capsular support, The same trocar setup can be used for Schutzler's intrascleral IOL fixation. Talking about another high quality FACO machine is Vittorio Picardo in from parts, Casa di Cura Nuevo e in Rome. Often are not able to meet with the patient on the surgical list in advance of surgery and the order of individual surgeries is not organized based on the perceived difficulties of the procedures. Cases of soft or hard cataracts and small pupils, for example, are peppered throughout each surgical session. Surgeons, therefore, must be prepared to complete surgical planning for each procedure on the fly. To prevent surgical complication from occurring, I rely on high-quality surgical instruments and devices, including knives, forceps and OVDs. At the top of my list, however, is the FACO machine. The Revolution FACO system helps me to perform safe and high-quality surgery routinely. With this platform, I can customize my surgical settings and parameters, which helps me to optimize the procedure and promotes exceptional surgical quality. I can also program separate settings for a variety of surgical situations, which is helpful when I am operating on cataracts of different grades and patients with different ocular anatomy. Additionally, I can switch between peristaltic and venturi pumps. When the density of the cataract is soft to medium, I do not sculpt the nucleus and I do not use the dual linear foot pedal function. My routine parameters with a peristaltic pump are as follows. Bottle height 80 cm, ultrasound power 35%, IA flow rate 30 ml per minute and vacuum 300 ml mercury. I use the same IA flow rate with or without ultrasound. These settings 
help me to use a divide and conquer or stop and chop technique in a controlled fashion in about 80% of cases. In certain complex situations, such as an eye with a small pupil, I modify my setting and use a Venturi pump. This combination helps me to keep the phaco tip in the center of the pupil. I can then move the nucleus pieces toward the tip. My routine parameters with the Venturi pump are as follows. Bottle height 80 cm, ultrasound power 20%, and vacuum 350 millimeters of mercury. I have achieved good functional results with frail FACO tips. Opticon has a research laboratory in Rome and I have collaborated with researchers both to develop settings for the company's existing FACO tips and to produce new tip models. This work has improved my FACO efficiency. The revolution system can also be used for vitro retinal surgery. If the posterior capsule ruptures during cataract surgery, I can immediately switch settings and complete a posterior vitrectomy safely and efficiently. Before we wrap up today's episode, I wanted to give a shout out to CRST's chief medical editors, past, present, and future. Today, the term influencer is most often used in social media to describe an individual who promotes brands and has influence over others' buying decisions. Long before the days of Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, however, CRST had its own army of influencers and our chief medical editors. John Doan, David Chang, Stephen Slade, Eric Donenfeld, Stephen Dell, Robert Weinstock, William Wiley, and our incoming 2022 chief, Kathleen McCabe, have not only promoted our brand, but also helped to shape the narrative of CRST while making a considerable impact on ophthalmology. I've had the pleasure of working with all these individuals over the years, and I couldn't be more grateful for their guidance, insights, and forethought. Cheers to them and cheers to all our editorial board members and past and future contributors. CRST is 20 years strong because of the fine individuals who have helped us keep our finger on the pulse of ophthalmology.